Detective Offner had deep lines across his brow and around his mouth. They drew his face into a grimace that Chandra suspected he wore all the time. Despite the surliness, she imagined how the creases must brighten his face like a stroke of lightning when he smiled. Chandra looked away to study her own dark features reflected in the surface of the coffee. It was mostly dregs from the urn beside the water cooler. On the other side of the desk, Offner leaned back in the squeaky swivel chair, settling the bright yellow legal pad on his crossed thigh. Clicking his pen open and closed a few times, he studied her with gallows silence. Dr. Day, could you tell me how you knew, Mr. Coach? Chandra thumbed the paper cup's cardboard sleeve. In the black liquid mirror, she watched herself reply. May I ask how he died? Offner powered over the question with a neutral expression. You called Mr. Coach's apartment on the day he died. Was it a personal call? Did you know him personally? The coffee burned Chandra's tongue. Mr. Coach was late for an appointment. The yellow paper crinkled as the detective scribbled a quick note. He returned his sharp blue gaze to meet hers. In what capacity were you his doctor? Chandra stared at the clean, neat lines of office accoutrements on the desk, squirming in her seat. I don't feel comfortable disclosing that information. With a solemn nod, Offner raised a hand in understanding. Of course. He allowed a reverent pause to pass, eyes closed. We're fairly certain that you are his psychiatrist. Would that be safe to assume, Dr. Day? Chandra grimaced and then nodded. Offner bowed his head, acknowledging her. My officers and I believe that Mr. Coach committed suicide. He leaned onto the chair arm and supported his head with his hand, furled except the thumb and forefinger. May I ask if he had any tendencies to corroborate that theory? Chandra's earrings glittered as she flung her head no. Hal wouldn't kill himself. Scratching her forehead, Chandra stared at the wall as if the correct phrases were hidden in the pores. He had delusions, but he wouldn't kill himself. Offner didn't react. He kept still, boring into her, pondering. Chandra suspected that the detective read the truth in tone and body language with as little effort as the blind read Braille, which, to the uninitiated, appears to be magic. With a few taps of the chin, Offner seemed done with his assessment. Mr. Coach threw himself out of his apartment window. It was on the seventh floor. Chandra scratched the sleeve of the paper cup again, harder this time. It made a hollow, grating sound. The coffee was awful. In the note that he left, he said specifically that he wanted you to know about his death. The chair squeaked as Offner pulled it forward again, hunching over the tidy desk, his face framed by mesh organizers on either side, he rested his forearms between the multicolored rows of sticky notes. Beneath pale skin, the tendons of his arms rippled as he laced together his fingers. He said he didn't want anyone getting hurt. He mentioned that something was coming for you. In the following silence, Chandra wondered if Offner ever went fishing. She pictured the grim detective in a rowboat on a foggy morning, wearing a bucket hat and a cargo vest adorned with lures, his line in the water, his eyes on the horizon, waiting. The clock on the wall went tick, tick, tick. His note talked about shadows, a man in a hat. Does any of this sound familiar? Chandra ran her fingers through her hair as if combing through memories. 
Hal was disturbed. The detective didn't move. He was in that rowboat on the cold, gray lake. Chandra left it at that. Is there any reason to suspect that someone might come after you? Chandra shook her head. Did Mr. Koch have any enemies? Hal was a nice man. Do you have any enemies? Taken off guard, Chandra hesitated a moment before shaking her head again. The question didn't belong in the life of a quiet psychiatrist. Detective Offner stared a little longer before he rowed the boat to shore. The chair creaked as he leaned back. Officer Kennedy will take your statement. I greatly appreciate your time, Dr. Day. I'm sorry for your loss. I hope the rest of your day is more pleasant. The dark storm of his dour, brooding scowl broke as he smiled. Elijah had a big copy of a Hieronymus Bosch painting in his office across from the door. Bright, naked men and women danced and thrived among mythic creatures in a green, pristine landscape and bizarre, futuristic architecture. All of them sought pleasure in some form or another. It was garish. The whole space seemed to invite distraction. Perhaps the break in orthodoxy was the reason why Chandra felt like Elijah was a good therapist. His personality dripped from the statues and paintings on the mint green walls and pooled onto the colorful rugs stretched over the beige carpet. He walked around without shoes. Elijah regularly invited Chandra to take off her black business heels, but she always refused. He told her that she wasn't the only psychiatrist to come in and leave on their shoes. Psychiatrists were always more guarded. Elijah settled back into his big armchair and crossed his legs. It must have been a very hard day for you. Chandra caught herself gulp. Yeah. Elijah cocked his head a little. Did you feel a particularly strong connection with this patient? No, not particularly. He had lost his job fairly recently and was seeing me about his anxiety. I think he was repressing memories of abuse he may have suffered as a child. The state was paying for his medication. He took unemployment very hard. I find it a little hard to believe that you wouldn't bind to this sort of person. What do you mean? I mean, why do we get into psychiatry in the first place, Chandra? He uncrossed his legs, leaned forward, arms out, and opened his round, bearded face into a smile. It's obviously to help people, am I right? So, if this patient of yours was in a particularly disadvantaged state, wouldn't you, wouldn't you connect more deeply with him? Chandra gave a quiet nod. She supposed he was right. I'm sorry you had to go through that ordeal. Did you read the note that he left? Well, the police kept it. It's still under investigation, and he wrote other things, I guess. Most of it was apologizing to everyone. To whom? Chandra shrugged. I'm not sure. He told me he didn't have any family. Did they let you read all of it? He apologized to me, said he was sorry that he missed our appointment, and then wrote that the shadows were going to come get me. Elijah's head flinched with intrigue. He fidgeted with the pen. Were these shadows one of his delusions? His only delusion. What would the shadows do? Just follow him, he said. I told him about pareidolia and perceptual drift, but he swore he saw them in broad daylight, right in front of him, where there could be no mistake. And he was frightened of them? Very. He associated them with his night terrors and sleep paralysis. How about you? What do you mean? Are you afraid of them? Chandra couldn't help but laugh. Of course not. 
That's ridiculous. Elijah shifted his head like a curious bird and cocked an eyebrow. Why is that? Obviously, they're not real. You are certain? Do you hear yourself? Of course I'm certain. Chandra scooted up to the edge of her chair and articulated each point with her hands as she spoke. Before the hallucinations, I was treating his anxiety, so there's the possibility that his medication and the disease itself affected his perception. Then there's the study about methamphetamine use and perceptual drift, which creates precisely that kind of illusion. Furthermore, a study done on patients with frontal lobe epilepsy caused them to detect shadowy presences. It's possible that he was self-medicating with meth, or that he was an undiagnosed epileptic, which could have been the source of his anxiety in the first place. She extended her arms wide for this point, eyebrows high to demonstrate her incredulity. Finally, there's the fact that it's simply not real. Elijah stroked his beard. But he believed they were, correct? Yes, he did, and that's what made him delusional. Elijah stroked his beard. When children believe in Santa Claus, they behave differently, correct? Parents can threaten that he won't bring them presents if they don't behave well. We don't call children delusional. He paused as if to get affirmation from Chandra, but it never came. He continued anyway. If something manages to have an effect in the physical world, doesn't that, to some extent, make it real? Chandra leaned back and crossed her arms. The muscles in her temples flexed as she clenched her jaw. She waited for the punchline. Elijah abandoned the line of reasoning. He settled back in the chair and crossed his legs, wiggling his toes. How are things with Riley? Chandra untied her arms and relaxed a little. They're good. He's been so supportive. We're actually going to dinner tonight. Oh, really? Yes, sushi. What a treat. It sounds like things are going a little smoother then. Chandra picked at a loose thread in her slacks. Yeah, a little. I remember you told me that you met Riley's parents. Elijah shifted through notes on the big yellow pad. Do you have any plans to introduce him to yours? Tucking hair behind her ear, she cast a look at the Hieronymus Bosch print across from the door. Men and women groped each other, pressing body against body in mindless intimacy, crouching with gaping mouths between giant birds clutching berries in their beaks. Elijah pulled his lips in and bobbed his head. I see. How does Riley feel about that? He's still not happy about it. He doesn't understand. My parents are from a different world. Do you think it'll come up at dinner tonight? Probably. Do you have a plan for how you're going to handle it? Nope. We'll see how it goes. Riley arrived right on time to pick Chandra up for their date. When Chandra opened the door, she couldn't believe how beautiful her girlfriend was. Riley took pleasure in Chandra's expression and posed, flashing a bright smile. Smoothing out her dress, she positioned her feet to show off her heels. The scent of Riley's perfume gave Chandra goosebumps as she leaned in to peck Riley's cheek. Bright red lipstick framed a round laugh and Riley asked, Ready to go? Music and talk filled the car on the drive to the restaurant like the buzz of power lines. The two women talked over each other, laughed, and spoke in their own dialect, the flow of it moving with all the beautiful chaos of a wide, swift river. The parking lot to Shiki Sushi was small, 
and the restaurant just as tiny. Shiki wasn't much to look at, but the sushi was good and the sake cheap. More important than the food, though, was the story. Riley had brought her here for their first date. The yin-yang above the door reminded Chandra how Riley had opened her up and showed her the unknown parts of her heart. She didn't understand all of those parts, but it was good to be herself with Riley. She unfastened her seatbelt but stopped before opening the door. The restaurant's sign illuminated Riley with a play of darkness and light. Chandra settled back into the seat and let her eyes wander over Riley's face. Riley froze when she noticed. You okay, Chuni? Yeah, just looking at you. You're so pretty. Riley dropped her gaze and tucked her hair behind her ear with a bashful smile. Let's go eat. Their table was tucked into the back, across from the koi tank. Reaching across to Chandra's side of the small table, Riley offered her hand. Chandra took it. How are you? I'm okay. The restaurant lights reflected in golden twinkles off of Riley's big hoop earrings as she turned her face to a curious slant. Her smile lingered, but she seemed unconvinced. The server arrived with their sushi and a warm bottle of sake. After a few bites, Riley's mouth hooked into a mischievous grin, and then her chopstick shot out, snatching a piece of Chandra's sushi. Hey! That was mine! Riley pushed her plate closer to Chandra. Go ahead, take one. That way, we'll be even. No way. Yours has eel. So what? I've been scared of eels ever since The Little Mermaid. Well, this eel is dead and delicious, so you don't have to worry about it. Riley smeared her sushi in the wasabi. They poured the sake and talked about plans for the weekend. Riley agreed to come over to spend the night. Also, my parents invited us to dinner next weekend. Chandra tapped her chopsticks tips against the long rectangular plate and then knocked over the last few pieces of sushi. That sounds good. She kept her eyes on the roll when she said it. Do you want to go? Yeah, of course. That sounds great. More space. Chandra poured each of them another cup of sake. Now the bottle was empty. She braced herself for the inevitable question to drop. The waiting was probably worse than the conversation, but that vague academic understanding did not equip her any better. So, when do I get to meet your parents? There was no more sushi to occupy herself with. Chandra picked at her napkin. I don't know. I can ask them when they're free. I really want to meet them, Chuni. I want you to meet them too. Riley leaned over the table and angled her face to catch Chandra's downcast eyes. Soon, okay? Chandra smiled as she sat up and drained the little bit of sake left in her cup. Yeah, soon. Riley pushed hers across. You can have mine. I don't want any more. As Chandra raised the cup to her lips, something scurried out. Appendages rippling, the shadowy little creature darted over her hand and down her wrist with the manic stops and starts of an insect. Chandra shrieked and rose as she tried to fling it away. The chair grated against the floor like teeth against bone, and the cup clattered onto the table, spilling warm liquor onto her pants. A stunned silence descended upon the restaurant, punctuated by saccharine Chinese pop music. Riley rushed to her side. What's wrong? What happened? Their server hurried over, expression nervous. Is everything all right, ma'am? Placing a hand on her shoulder, Riley added. Are you okay, babe? Chandra closed her eyes and took a breath. There was no sign of the thing. 
She questioned if she'd even seen anything until the memory of its whisper-fine legs traced a line down her arm. I think you guys have cockroaches. This server's face went white and his jaw dropped. Oh, no. I assure you that's not possible. The health department- I know what I saw. But did she? She pushed the doubt away. Riley covered her mouth with the back of her hand. Oh, gross. I saw it come out of the cup. Or maybe around it. The server's head oscillated left and right like an out-of-control polygraph. I'm sure you were just seeing things. Uh, perhaps a trick of the light. The remark hit her like a blow and she flinched. She doubled down. I know what I saw. At the same time, Riley took a step forward and snarled, Don't you talk to her like that. Another man, whom Chandra assumed was the manager, now approached. He apologized for the server's behavior, and with a reassuring smile, hands raised in diplomatic surrender, told them that their meal was on the house. Riley reached for Chandra, but she pulled her arms around herself. They didn't touch until they got into the car. A sad uneasiness coated Chandra the following day, and she wasn't sure how to place it. She couldn't decide if it was because of the cockroach, or because Riley had called her babe in public, or because the unsettled conversation about meeting her parents lingered in her ears like mud. Her patients didn't notice her distraction, though. Chandra was adept at wearing masks. By the last session of the day, she was exhausted from forcing her attention to them, opening canned responses and coping strategies, spreading them thin over their problems. She considered slogging through some billing paperwork before leaving, but knew any effort put toward the stack would be in vain. As she left the office, she dialed her mother. The phone almost went to voicemail. Her mother's greeting was curt. I'm a little busy, darling. What's wrong? Chandra wilted. Nothing, Mama. I just wanted to say hi. I have some time on my hands, and I just wanted to see how you're doing. If you had a boyfriend, you wouldn't have to worry about extra time. Mama! When do I get to play with grandbabies? She should have known it would go like this. I'm busy. She slammed the car door extra hard as if to demonstrate. The summer sun had baked the car and now the leather burned. Too busy to date. In the background, Mohammed Rafi sang, so she must be cooking. You're a young woman. You're beautiful. Don't tell me there aren't any men. The neighbors have a son. He's a lawyer. I could invite him to dinner and you could come. Chandra sighed. This had been a mistake. I'll let you go, Mama. It sounds like you're busy. Go to a bar and talk to a handsome man. I'll think about it. Chandra tossed the phone onto the passenger seat with a groan. She fumed, drumming her fingers on the steering wheel. The only thing her mother ever seemed to care about anymore was grandchildren. It didn't matter that Chandra had a PhD, it didn't matter that she ran a successful private practice. All that mattered was her distinct lack of children. Riley got to joke around with her parents. They talked to Chandra like she was a normal person, like nothing was wrong with her. According to them, she lacked nothing. At the very precipice of her vision, the twitch of a dark figure caught her eye. Chandra blinked and looked again. It, it, was, it was gone. A, a trick of the light. Shaking her head, she turned the key. The car rumbled to life, and she checked the mirror to back out. A man sat in the back seat. 
He was shadow. Not merely dark, nor dressed in the darkness, but rather a well in which the darkness itself collected. The figure was lightlessness so total that no mouth, eyes, nor nose was discernible. In fact, his only distinguishing feature was the broad-brimmed hat. Chandra whirled around, a wild shriek exploding from her gut. The man with the hat was gone. Chandra closed her eyes and pinched the bridge of her nose. She was stressed. Stress often manifests with unusual side effects. But as she drove, she checked the rearview mirror often. Once home, the garage door closed like the mouth of an enormous beast swallowing the light. Chandra's hand still shook. The garage light clicked off almost as soon as she got out of the car. Aside from the BMW's dome light, the darkness was complete. Something wasn't right. Her head swirled and she plunged into a strange, nauseous disorientation. She tried to, to write it off as nerves. The garage was too dark. Too vast. The blackness deepened thickening until it was solid as slate. The dome light was so distant now, as if she were in the middle of a dark lake at night and looking at a cottage on the shore. The ground bucked and roiled and the light grew more and more distant. Chandra threw out a hand to stabilize herself and found the door. Shocked by the sudden discovery of a solid so close to her amidst the perversion of space, she tore her hand away as if she'd just touched a screaming kettle. The dome light was just a pinprick in the distance now. Her lungs pumped short, erratic breaths. The door hadn't moved even as the light grew more and more distant, almost gone, her way lost without it. Twisting the knob, Chandra stumbled backwards into the laundry room. Sunbeams leaked from the house and into the garage where the BMW sat a few feet away. The yellow dome light faded. Chandra leaned against the dryer and ran quaking fingers through her hair. It had been such a visceral hallucination. How couldn't it be real? Visions of Hal plummeting from the seventh story window flashed across her mind. Clenching her jaw, she released a long sigh through her nose. Don't be ridiculous, she thought. You're stressed. A headache bloomed. Massaging her temples, she got a glass of water in the kitchen. The cold water helped. Leaning against the sink with the glass in hand, she stared out of the window overlooking the neighborhood. At the intersection, a little way down the street, stood the man in the hat. Chandra dropped the glass, which exploded on the tile. Eyes locked on the figure, she took a few steps backwards before slipping on the spilled water and thudding hard on the floor. Large shards of broken glass dug into her back and sliced into her arms and hands. The vent in the ceiling vomited hundreds of dark, light-sucking spiders like the creatures she'd seen at the restaurant. Screaming in a mindless language of fear, she scuffled backwards, the glass burrowing deeper into her palms, thighs, and back, slickening the floor with warm blood. 
The spiders spilled across the ceiling, creeping, crawling, spreading in a jagged, irregular ellipsis as if a single, solid mass. Then came the presence. Chandra didn't see it because the kitchen island blocked her view, but she felt it the way one detects a fire's heat. The headache worsened. A high-pitched ring whined through her skull, throttling all other sound. The presence's intensity increased. A head appeared from the other side of the island, and then shoulders, and then a torso. Chandra knew she screamed, but the ringing was so intense that it devoured the sound in her throat. The shadow stopped. The second time Chandra shouted, she heard her voice, even though it echoed as if from the bottom of a well. Teeth clenched. She glared and then flung the words at him with all her might. The shadow appeared to shudder, the crisp inky edges blurring like static snow on an old television. One by one, the spiders fell from the ceiling like a dark hailstorm. They melted, not into the floor like water, nor into the air like smoke, but rather into nothing, disintegrating atom by atom. The shadow fought against her will like gravity against a rocket, but Chandra pushed back. Her heartbeat throbbed in her temples. The shadow flickered. His opacity wavered. Chandra let forth one last barbaric howl, and then he was gone. Chandra was alone in the kitchen, lying on broken glass, soaking in water and her own blood. No spiders, no ominous shadow in a hat. Shaking, she pulled herself up the kitchen island and fumbled with her phone as she leaned against the counter. Riley brought a first aid kit to do some of the healing, but the wounds needed stitches. Chandra didn't flinch against the alcohol swabs or when Riley pulled shards of glass out of her injuries. Halfway through the work, Riley stopped and encouraged Chandra to sit up. She put a gentle hand on Chandra's cheek and stroked it, tucking back a lock of hair behind her ear with the other. Baby, you've got to tell me what happened. Chandra shook her head. Riley's eyes begged. Chandra's chin sliced through the air a second time. The drive to the hospital was still and quiet, like a fetid pond. The wind went all around them, and the tires went click, 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 as they passed over seams in the highway. Chandra kept her eyes closed. She never stopped shaking. Riley cast a few glances her way and kneaded the steering wheel. What happened, baby? Please, you've got to tell me. Weighed down by the guilt of Riley's concern, Chandra confessed. Something attacked me. Riley cast her another look and then returned her gaze to the road. Like a man? Riley cast her another look and then returned her gaze to the road. They went over the bridge. Chandra looked out at the river. Something like that. I don't understand, Chuni. Chandra shook her head. I don't want to talk about it. 
Riley flapped her mouth, looking for words. She apparently couldn't think of any. Chandra didn't say anything more until they got to the hospital, and when the doctor asked what happened, Chandra said that she tripped over the dishwasher. The doctor cocked an eyebrow and clenched her jaw. You're safe here. Did your boyfriend do this? Riley scoffed. Doctor, we're... Chandra forced a smile, nervous laughter fluttering from high in her throat. No, he didn't. Really, doctor, I'm fine. My boyfriend and I are fine. I'm just super clumsy. The doctor's jaw tightened. She looked at Riley and then back to Chandra. Who is this, by the way? Chandra cut Riley off before she could speak. We're friends. Just friends. Riley's face went ashen. With a sigh, the doctor relented. She stitched Chandra up and didn't bother with small talk. Riley excused herself to go to the bathroom, and Chandra watched her sulk across urgent care, running conversations through her own head to manage the fallout. Something moved. It was low to the ground, like a mongoose, and fast like one too. Chandra only saw the thing in the corner of her eye, and the sight made her jump, pulling against the stitches and causing the doctor to exclaim, Hey, take it easy! The thing snaked along the floor on the other side of the emergency room, slipping around the wheels of hospital beds and at the joints where the floor and wall meet, hugging the shadows. It evaded the light by sliding into the darkness at the heels of the doctors and nurses. It climbed the dark troughs of hospital curtains, pooling in the room's farthest corner. She felt the presence as clearly as one can feel heat radiate from a stove and knew that, though she could not see him, he was there watching her. Maybe she'd been wrong. Maybe he was real. Riley insisted on staying the night, which suited Chandra just fine. It saved her the embarrassment of having to ask. Riley found some leftover lamb kofta and rice with masala sauce in the refrigerator. The scent of cumin and chili powder filled the whole house as it warmed up in the microwave. Chandra wondered if Riley had forgiven her for what she'd said in the hospital. They hadn't talked about it, and it followed on the heels of all their words like a shadow. Did your mom make this? Riley wiped her mouth with a napkin. It's good. Chandra nodded. Thanks. My daughter, my dad's mom, didn't think my mom could cook. She didn't want her son marrying a woman who couldn't feed him well. So my mom had dinner with them like every night and helped my daughter cook dinner. She learned all of her recipes, and only after my daughter said she perfected them did she give my dad her blessing. Riley smiled. That's a sweet story. I guess. I think it makes my daughter pretty mean. Really? I think it shows how much she loved your dad and how much your mom loves him too. I don't think a lot of women would put up with a mother-in-law like that. Chandra scraped up the last of the masala sauce in her bowl and licked the spoon clean. My family's pretty old school. Her words dangled in the air like a hanged man. Riley stared into her bowl and pushed the last kofta ball around with her spoon. You don't talk about them much. My daddy and dada died a long time ago. Same with my mom's parents. I only got to visit them in India once. I meant your parents. Chandra stood up. Are you done with your bowl? I'm gonna put mine away. 
Riley played with her remaining food. She heaved the most solemn sigh Chandra had ever heard, and then opened her mouth as if to say something. Chandra hurried to the sink, rinsed her bowl, and put it in the dishwasher. Her palms sweat like a cold glass on a hot day. Chandra watched Riley from the kitchen's safety. Maybe if she waited long enough, Riley wouldn't ask more. Chuni? The pet name, which had made Chandra's heart sing countless times, now made it fall into the pit of her stomach. Do your parents know about us? Chandra's blood rushed into her ears with the roar of a waterfall. She felt her pulse throb in her throat. The half second she took to make a decision felt like half an hour. Yes. She lied. The bowl clanked as Riley scraped up the last of her rice and masala. You should tell your mom that I'll learn how to make all of her dishes if that's what it takes to get her blessing. Chandra came up behind the chair and wrapped Riley in her arms. Come on, let's watch something. They moved to the couch and watched reality TV in each other's arms. After two narrow escapes with ruin, Chandra needed something to distract herself from the day. Since returning from the hospital, she tried to convince herself that everything was made up. But as the night deepened, it became harder and harder to believe that story. It was almost midnight when Riley woke herself up with her snores. She yawned, reached for the remote, and told Chandra that it was time. Chandra gulped, grateful that Riley was too tired to notice. She hesitated at the bedroom door and looked down the hall. It had never seemed so long. The living room had never seemed so far away. In the darkness, she could make out the kitchen's faint lines, the sink framed by the window and the dim street lights, a few cabinets, the island where the figure stood earlier that day. Draped in a sheet of shadows, all of it was hostile territory now. Something touched her shoulder and she flung herself away, screaming. Riley stumbled back against the corridor, hands up in defense. Juni, it's just me. Chandra ran her fingers through her hair and sat on the floor. She didn't even wince when she leaned her back against the wall. She repressed sobs that pushed against her throat. An arm around Chandra's shoulder, Riley said, Something really bad happened today, and you're not telling me. What's going on? Chandra's hair whipped around her face as she shook her head. Riley held her close and stroked her. Her voice was as soft as the yellow petals of dandelions. Let's go to bed. You'll feel better tomorrow morning. Chandra clutched at Riley's shirt. She sobbed once more and met with the light of Riley's bright, hazel eyes. Surely, she thought, those eyes could give her strength to fight off the darkness. They turned off the light in the hallway, and for one horrible moment, the shadows engulfed Chandra whole. Riley reassured her as she opened the bedroom door and guided Chandra inside, one hand on her arm, another on her shoulder. She flipped on the bedroom light and guided Chandra to the bed with love and patience. Chandra got under the covers, Riley turned off the light, and then joined her, holding her tight but mindful of her wounds. It took a while but finally Chandra fell asleep. 
When she awoke, the room was swathed in darkness. It didn't feel like much time had passed. Beside her, Riley lay on her stomach, body rising and falling with soft, uneven breaths that sighed like distant waves. Chandra stroked her arm, and Riley murmured in her sleep. Her long, blonde hair curled towards Chandra, and the scent of rose and coconuts wafted towards her. She smiled. Chandra had never liked sleeping on her side. She flipped, trying to lay on her back despite the injuries, which was a terrible mistake. She tried turning over again to hold Riley, but couldn't. Her body froze. Her arms, legs, hands, feet, even her head and fingers remained totally immobile. Panic swelled, and she was ashamed to catch herself whimpering. It's sleep paralysis. It's just sleep paralysis. Wake up. A headache split Chandra's head apart, and like the blaring horn of an approaching train, the ringing in her ears crescendoed. Her heart beat so fast that she thought it might erupt. A tear rolled down her frozen face as she flung her gaze around the room. Slowly, the door opened. Under the dark threshold stood a figure even darker than the shadows surrounding him. He wore a wide-brimmed hat. Chandra whimpered. She still could not move. The shadow glided towards her, moving as if he were on a well-oiled track. He raised his arms to his sides and long, pointed fingers slid out from his sleeves. He appeared two-dimensional, like a paper cutout, and the space around him warped the way the garage had. The door drifted farther and farther away, and the bedroom became impossibly tall. The closer the shadow got, the more distorted the effect. He expanded in proportion, growing larger than fear and taller than hope. Chandra flung her eyes to the other side of the bed where Riley was miles away. Even if Chandra managed to wake her, she'd never be there in time to help. The shadow stood beside the bed, bent at the stomach, body contorted like a question mark. He brought his featureless face close to hers. Out of the black face, two diamond-shaped slits opened, made out of the cleanest, sharpest white. Chandra tried moving her hands to push him away or flail her legs to kick him, but she couldn't lift a finger. Tears ran down her face, the pain in her head worsened. Without moving his head, or shifting the white diamond eyes, the shadow turned his attention from Chandra to Riley. A long white crescent expanded from the middle of his face until its corners reached the diamond eyes. Then he brought his attention back to Chandra. Take her. Take her instead of me. She couldn't believe that she was capable of the thought, but it came so easy. When she thought about taking them back, she was surprised to find that she wouldn't. No, 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 she could not. She could not take them back. She had so much to do, so much to live for. She could find another Riley. 
Please, take her. The shadow did not take Riley. It straightened up and melted into an inky pool on the bedroom floor. It snaked out of the room, face still smiling, hat still intact. As he exited the threshold, the door closed with a quiet click, and the spell over Chandra's body broke. Immediately, she flipped onto her side and wrapped her shaking arms around Riley. In a quiet burble, Chandra wept. She apologized over and over and over again, and Riley held her, offering soft, confused reassurances. Chandra curled into a ball and pressed her face against Riley's chest, begging forgiveness with a raspy voice until the sun came up. After that, tensions worked hard to undo the ties that bound them together. Chandra became distant, her heart having discovered a dark, tumultuous sea within herself. How must it make Riley feel? Chandra couldn't possibly know. After all, Riley had been asleep when the shadow had come, and there was no way that she could understand. Chandra's shift had come from nothing. It had fallen from the sky with as little warning as an alien ship or a dark shadow in a broad-brimmed hat. She saw him more, or at least thought she did. He lived in her peripherals, just deep enough into her vision to startle her. She knew he was there, but he kept far enough away that maybe he wasn't. He took something from her whenever she saw him, though she couldn't tell what. Every time he vanished, there was a little less of her, but she didn't know how. Whenever she thought about him, she knew he fed upon something of hers, but she didn't know why. Cold air collapsed from the refrigerator as Chandra looked for something easy to eat. She'd bailed on Riley's invitation for dinner with family. Her eyes fell on the leftover chicken korma and rice her mother had made for her. As it rotated in the whining microwave, Chandra heated a few pieces of naan in a frying pan. The microwave beeped and Chandra stirred the food before putting it in again. It all smelled so good. Riley would like Mama. They could sit with Mama and Baba, a big steaming pot of butter chicken at the center of the table, a bowl of basmati to pass around, and a plate of naan. They could show her how to tear off pieces of naan and scoop up the chicken and rice. Baba could tell stories about how Daddy cooked it when he was growing up. Mama would tell Riley the story about how she had learned to cook all of Daddy's recipes, and even though Riley already knew it, she would listen and laugh and smile. Chandra imagined it over and over again. She wanted that so badly. Riley had forgiven what she'd said at the hospital, but Chandra knew she still carried the wound with her. Dinner with Mama and Baba would be a start to the healing. But it required a huge step first. Beside the mostly empty plate sat her phone. On the lock screen was a picture she'd taken of Mount Rainier from the window of the plane. She and Riley had grown so close on that trip to Seattle. Riley's phone had a selfie of them taken at the top of the Space Needle. Chandra never put a picture with Riley on her phone. She picked up the phone and went to her contacts, thumb hovering over Mama. 
She thought about how much fun it had been meeting Riley's parents, how it had validated her. Riley would never feel like that with her parents. She wiped up the smears of sauce left on the plate with the last scrap of naan, but it all turned to ash in her mouth. That night, she dreamed of the shadow. Chandra woke up late that Saturday. Rods of golden sunlight streamed through her bedroom window and she threw the covers off her sweat-soaked body. It was going to be a hot day. On the bedside table, her cell phone rang with a number she didn't recognize. Dr. Day, this is Detective Offner. It took Chandra a moment to place the name in the voice. Hello, Detective. What can I do for you? Sounds like I woke you up. I'm sorry. It's okay. Is everything all right? I'm sorry I have to ask, but could I have you come down to the station, please? Chandra ran a hand through her hair. I don't know if I understand. Has something come up in Hal's case? Were you familiar with one Riley Bennett? Her blood ran cold. Why did he use the past tense? Yes, I am. There was a disturbance at her apartment early this morning. She waited for the detective to continue, but finally buckled under the heavy burden of silence. Is she all right? What happened? Is Riley okay? Miss Bennett is no longer with us. The room spun out of control. The light was too much to bear. Had, had Riley skipped town? Chandra didn't understand. Well, what, what happened? Our preliminary investigation suggests that she was murdered. The sentence was stiff and flat, like the detective had popped it straight out of a can. The air in the room vanished. Chandra couldn't breathe. The world swirled and tears pressed behind her eyes. The light was too much. Dr. Day, are you all right? Chandra cleared her throat. Yes. I'm all right. Who would she eat sushi with? Who would stroke her hair and call her Johnny? Who would text her every morning to ask about her dreams? May I ask what your relationship with Miss Bennett was? It seems as if you two were close. Chandra put a shaky hand on her forehead and squeezed her eyes shut. She felt a sob shudder up from her gut, but she suppressed it by clenching her teeth until she heard them groan. We were friends, just friends. At the edges of the late morning sunlight spilling into the room, shadows swirled together. The room expanded until the walls were too far away to see, and then the living darkness swarmed over the floor. At the foot of Chandra's bed rose the shadow. He leaned forward opened a serrated smile and whispered in her ear, You can always find another Riley.
Thank you for sharing my nightmares and helping me carry the grief. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share your favorite story with a friend or family member. It goes a long way. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and tell me your thoughts in the comments below. If you'd like to go the extra mile, you can find me on Patreon, where you'll get early episodes and behind-the-scenes insights into each story. You can keep in touch with me on Instagram or at nightmaresandgrief.com. Thanks again for spending this time with me. Peace.